All right, start with that problem we ended with the other day. Um, looking at the different confirmations of, of that, he was methyl, methyl pentane. Uh, let me get downloaded and started here. So that'd be so that'd be three methyl hexanes. And we haven't we haven't gone into naming stereo centers yet, so don't worry about that at this point. Um, for this confirmation, the way it's drawn, let's try let's start by drawing the um, I think probably makes the most sense. So anytime you've got two identical substituents, um, like this bond, this bond is probably, is not going to be as interesting to see what's going on as for this one. If we look at this, especially given that the problem asks about the, the rotating the C3, C4 bonds. That's where we've got a lot of different things attached there. So let's look there. So we're going to be looking, let's look from in the plane of the board, looking at it that way, and try and draw a Newman projection. And we'll do, I'm going to draw the front carbon in blue and the back carbon in red. So we'll start with the blue. So first off, we know that we're going to draw these things roughly 120 degrees from each other, right? And then it's just a matter of, okay, from this angle, do we want our, our vertical bond to be going straight up or straight down, just based on the perspective that where it's drawn right now? Yeah, it would make the most sense if we're sitting here or having to claim the board looking that way. This bond here, this ethyl group, is going straight up. And then from that same point of view, that means then we have a Methyl going down into the right and the hydrogen down into the left. So if I started with drawing mine straight down, it'd be hydrogen two methyl double, right? Or you started with the with the methyl to the right. Yeah, that that would work. Um but sort of I was looking at it kind of. Yeah, as long as you're consistent with how you're going to draw the back part thing. Okay. Otherwise, you wind up switching stereo isomers if you're not careful. The rest of the class hasn't seen yet, but you know the danger in that. So then if we're looking at the red carbon, then we have two hydrogens, and it can be helpful when we're doing these to draw those hydrogens in, um, just so you can see that three-dimensional shape. We should have a hydrogen going straight up and out towards us, one hydrogen up and into the board, based on where the other two bonds are, right? Which means that we're sitting in a staggered confirmation where our two hydrogens here and here, and then we have an ethyl group straight down. That's what you started with. Yeah. Okay. Um, a small note too on some some shorthand that you'll see in other places. Um, organic chemists get really lazy when they're trying to to write out substituents in situation like this. So drawing the skeletal structure for this, it's pretty 
pretty straightforward to just to show all of the bonds, right? But when we have, when we're focused on this C3 to C4 bond, these other substituents, a lot of times these other substituents, rather than write C2H5, um, organic chemists have a, have a habit of just writing an ethyl group as capital E lowercase t, almost like it's an atomic symbol. So sometimes it means the same thing. You have C2H5, but you'll just see it written as ET. Or, and for a methyl group, sometimes you'll see ME. Not molybdenum be MO anyway. So they, they try not to do it with, with abbreviations that actually have atomic symbols, or if they do, they're like the rarer metals. Sometimes when I'm reading like, Biochem papers, there will be stuff with that, like ME attached mm -hmm. to something else. Like, what is that? That's a methyl group. Okay. Um, and occasionally, if it's like if it's a methoxy group, you'll see OME. If it's a, mm -hmm. an ether, an OME means like, or if you've ever worked as a paramedic or in a hospital, a lot of times you'll see ETOH is the shorthand for ethanol. So if somebody is is drunk wandering around the hospital or in the ER or something like that, they'll just they'll read out on the on the intercom ETOH um, or make an art like that's sort of like the you know code three means clean up on aisle five or whatever. Um, ETOH ETOH means <laughs> means somebody's been drinking. Um, so and you don't see that as much with with anything larger than methyl. Occasionally, propyl, you'll see PR for propyl, but That's once you start getting to that point, then, then you just use the condensed structure really because you want to show more information. All right, so if this is our, our, um, our Newman projection, that's the term, what's going to be the lowest possible confirmation that we could have? Um, or the ethyl groups are in the anti position with the biggest groups in the anti position, which it could be in it now, or you could rotate the back 60 degrees clockwise. You rotate the back 60 degrees clockwise. We put the ethyl, it's not this because this is a methyl group, not an ethyl. Oh, right on. Gotcha. That so, right, it's already in its lowest possible confirmations. Gotcha. If they're both the same size, then you're absolutely right, because they'd be equivalent, and then it wouldn't matter. Um, here we have the ethyl group is gouged to a methyl, but anti to the other ethyl. If we rotate it any other way, we get these, these two ethyls wind up being gouged to each other, which is less favorable. What would be the highest? So... The highest energy confirmation in terms of the trans as a transition state. It's not technically a conformer because technically conformers have to be at that potential energy minimum. But the highest energy configuration, so the least stable, so the least stable. Eclipse version if you rotate. And what would you want eclipsed to be the highest energy state? Yeah. We want to put the ethyls on top of each other. So 180 on the back. So rotate at 180 on the back. Or front. <laughs> Should be the same either way, right? It's for generally speaking, it seem, seems to be the standard operating procedure that you rotate what's in the back and you keep the front the same. Okay. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. I highly recommend not changing both of them at the same time, but it doesn't matter which one you keep constant and which one you rotate. Gotcha. There's just too many variables changing. For if you try to rotate both of them at the same time, it's it's really easy to trip yourself up. All right, so feeling okay about these type of, of things, and frankly, Getting from the skeletal structure to the Newman projection with everything in the right position is the trickiest part of these. I think everybody understands 
biggest things eclipsed as high energy, biggest things anti as lowest energy. Um, so I, I think we're okay on that, but if there's any other questions? Okay. Say when you when you ask when you ask the class a question like that, you're supposed to wait wait until it feels like the silence is awkward and then wait another five seconds. <laughs> um, I'm not very good at that. So feel free to interrupt if I move on too quickly. So let's talk about cycloalkanes because cycloalkanes have their own bunch of uh, wrinkles when it comes to their conformers and their energy. The most, the most basic concept that we introduce when we get into uh, cycloalkanes is actually similar to what we were talking about before. The sterics before it could create, a, when you're in those higher energy states, those eclipse states, and you have those big groups pushing on each other, it created a little bit of what we call strained energy. And strain energy is literally just that. So when you have, when you put big groups next to each other or lock them into a certain configuration, it causes the bond angles to deviate from your perfect 109.5 of a regular tetrahedral structure. Could that happen without the cyclic structure? Yeah, you could. You can think about if we looked at the actual. I just like to correct this definition. The um, the actual eclipse confirmation here, where we put the two ethyls on top of each other, you're not actually going to have 109.5 degrees between them. If we rotated the two ethyls so that we had had them looking like this. This bond angle is because these are the biggest things and they're pushing on each other the most. That's not going to be 109.5. It'll be more obtuse. It'll be more obtuse, and that's going to force everything else a little closer together on the on the other side. So that's another form of strain energy. Is anytime the bonds or the sterics force things out of an ideal geometry, that creates a little bit of strain energy. It's true, like polar um, molecules, right? Like water, it doesn't have what. Yeah, the, the lone pairs on water create the same thing. Lone pairs take up more space than the bonds on water. So water, the bond angle for water. So then if we have a lone pair coming out towards us and a lone pair into the board away from us, this bond is actually only about 105 degrees instead of 109.5 because the and that also is another form of strain energy anytime you've got a difference in asymmetry in the things that are around that central atom you're going to have some degree of asymmetry that way some degree of um of strain and the larger the objects are the more strain you're going to cause the more deviation you you see from that perfect tetrahedral structure Right, so, but the, the place we really see it is when we're actually locked into um, a certain shape. So, for instance, if we actually had a cyclopropane, all three of these carbons are, are still sp3. They're still tetrahedral, but the, by the nature of it being a triangle, a, an equilateral triangle, we're locking them into being like 60 degrees. That's a huge amount of strain energy because you, we're deviating from our regular, um, our standard bond angles by almost 60 degrees, almost half, right? And so with that in mind, um, that makes these bonds weaker. Because it turns out if, if these sigma bonds are caused by, by these different sp3 orbitals overlapping, the more overlap you get, the stronger the bond is. Well, what actually winds up happening is we can't actually force these to be as close together as they want to here. So it actually winds up making what's called, what they call like a banana bond, where instead of it being a nice linear bond, you actually wind up with it being kind of shaped like a banana. So it's more of a circle. 
So it's yeah, it's it's not a true triangle. We have to we could draw it as a triangle, but the bond shapes are not a true triangle shape because they wind up being bent. This is being so pushed in that exactly. exactly. So yeah, instead of straight, it winds up doing that. And so that's that's where a lot of this strain energy comes from. The sigma bond should be able to have this level of overlap and have be this stable, but it's not. And so that makes it so that bond is actually higher in energy than it normally would be. Um, and we see that with with almost everything up until so these two especially, we almost never see these two structures in. I don't want to say in the real world because it's, the lab is still considered the real world, um, but you, we don't see them in nature. Three-sided rings, um, very rarely do you see them in nature, and even a four-sided, you see it, there's some structures, some antibiotics actually have a four-sided ring where I think one of the corners might be a sulfur. I think a lot of, um, I think penicillin might have that shape. Um, it's either penicillin or certain class of sulfa drugs. Um, but it, one of the reasons that that's, that's so effective as an antibiotic is because it's super reactive, because it's unstable. Those would be seen more in like a double sigma structure, right? Right, and, and, the pen, and if it's penicillin, I'll just throw, throw up Moby real quick so we can all look at it and see if that's the one that I'm thinking it is. Looks like it. It, it looks like it has a square in there. Yeah, it looks like a nitrogen. It has a cycle of butane with the nitrogen. Yeah, cycle of butane. That little section right there. So it's a cyclic amide. That's not going to be very, there is a sulfur, but that's it's not part of the four sided ring. Um, that's going to be really reactive. And, it's, and I, as I recall, one of the, the mechanism of penicillin reacting is there's a certain protein in different classes of bacteria um, that this will react with to render that protein inoperable or not inoperable so that that protein can't perform its duty and that prevents the bacteria from, from replicating. So it just changes the shape of the protein. But yeah, they have something. Yeah. If you wanted to try to keep somebody from driving their car, you could stick a piece of gum in their ignition. <laughs> That's effectively what you do here: is you you render it inoperable by basically taking one of the critical pieces of machinery and gumming <laughs> it up with with this compound. That was a great analogy. <laughs> so, no, I mean that's yeah. it's, it's a that's a uh, an example of what in biochem we call a competitive inhibitor. They're both competing for the same active site. If you can get your competitive inhibitor in there and irreversibly react with it, basically you've just neutralized the entire cell, um, which is what we're trying to do with antibiotics. We don't like to see that with um, medications. Medications, we want them to bind reversibly. Um, so that would be like slowing down somebody getting in their car by putting a different key in there that won't turn, but then they have to like, take the key out and then put their key in, right? So just by competing for that spot, you wind up slowing things down, um, which, but we don't want to do it irreversibly, especially if we're talking about like psych meds or something like that. We don't want to permanently render somebody's brain chemistry different. Right. Um, it, you know, that, that's effectively a, a lobotomy at that point. We don't want to do that. Um, so there's, is always a fine line, but it's one of the reasons biochemistry is so fascinating is because it has all of these different variables you need to balance. Sometimes we want it irreversible if it's an antibiotic, but sometimes we want it reversible so it doesn't cause permanent damage. Some, you know, it, all of this, all of the different systems are all connected in the body, um, which means you can't change anything over here without changing everything else, um, which makes it a really fascinating balancing act. Penicillin is naturally occurring in- It is. Right? It's not it is. synthesized in any way, it's just extracted. These days, actually I believe, so- Well, I'm sure they synthesize it, but like- it's They actually grow it in ge genetically modified yeast. Yeah. Most of the higher yield 
right? So you you can basically yeast is a really what they call a model organism. Um, it's really well understood. It's really easy, relatively easy to mod to modify the um, genome. And so basically, you can stick in the gene for, in, for penicillin production with a promoter in front of it to make it so that the yeast produces a ton of penicillin on its own. Whether and you can do that with things like insulin. Um, most insulin is grown from yeast these days too. In the early days, they used to use pig insulin because it was close enough to human insulin. Um, but now we have, we have human insulin being produced by yeast, um, which you know provides the yeast no benefit whatsoever because insulin really is only useful in a multicellular organism yeah. um, as a way to communicate between different parts of the body. So it like it has no business being in yeast from a like benefit to the yeast point of view, but it's really useful for us because then we don't need to like, you know, insert it into a mouse and then deal with all of the moral implications of like killing thousands of mice to harvest insulin from them. So it's um, going to be a byproduct of one of their own? Basically, yeah, you set it up so that they produce insulin in high amounts, even though they don't need it. Right. Um, and so that's, that's what's called bioprocess engineering. You, you genetically modify usually yeast, but sometimes E. coli, sometimes other microbes, um, and then set them up in a in a way so that you can continually either continuously harvest them or just periodically you just go through take all your yeast and you break them all down and take out the insulin and, and yeah, everything else goes into the waste. And for whatever reason. Uh, people get less squeamish about that than they do if it's you know a mammal that we're doing that to. Um, I think South Park did an episode it's sort of like that. Did you call you Google or the pig part? Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, there's um, a little bit of reference to that. <laughs> when actually, they, they the first heart transplants were pig parts, right? Um, before there, they before just, they invented the what there's a there's a name for the for an artificial heart based on the, the inventor, and I can't remember what that name is, but yeah, before they had artificial hearts um, that they would do for a heart transplant, they were using the pig hearts. Yeah. Um, anyway, back away from biology, because that stuff's all way too complicated. <laughs> um, you can see here that once we get past a five-sided ring, we start getting into sort of the sweet spot of Cyclopentanes and cyclohexanes are actually relatively stable. Um, cyclopentane is pretty close to your 109.5. It's not right there, so it's still a little bit of strain, um, especially we'll talk about some different aspects of that in a second. And 120 seems like that'd be worse, but cyclohexanes are actually more stable than cyclopentanes when it comes to the, the strain energy. And that's because we're not actually just dealing with it in two dimensions, right? By having 120 degrees here, it actually winds up sort of folding itself into pretty close to 109.5 because we have three dimensions to work with. We don't actually wind up with it staying planar. So we just pull up the structure for the cyclox. It looks planar from above, but you'll notice that the hydrogens aren't identical, right? If we rotate it around, you can see that it actually sort of pokes like kind of up and down. If you think of those four in the middle as being a plane, then you've got one that pokes up above the plane a little bit and one that pokes below the plane a little bit. And that allows them to all be 109.5 or really close to it, even though a regular hexagon is 120 degrees. So by having three dimensions to work in, we actually can get these, these cyclohexanes to be really, really stable, which is why they're so common. And then once you take all of these if you take all of these carbons, you make them sp2. What's the bond angle supposed to be on a trigonal planar? It's trigonal planar. What are the bond angles around each of those atoms? 
120. So that's why benzene and graphene and naphthalene are all totally perfectly planar. And one of the reasons why they're super stable with six, with six, why they tend to make these hexagons is because that gets you the perfect bond angles for if it's sp2. If it's sp3, it doesn't want to be 120, but having six things or six um, points around this, this polyhedron allows them to flex in three dimensions in a way that still gets you really close to your ideal bond angles. Um, so that reason, the geometry of it and the bond angles of the atoms is exact is why hexagons are everywhere in organic chemistry. Why that's the most common shape that we see is because it's the most stable in terms of this strain energy. Um, you do see cycloheptanes, heptagons, um, for the similar reason. You start with that interior angle winds up being even larger, but with seven things moving around in three dimensions, you can still get pretty close to um, you can still get pretty close to 109.5. And once you start getting above that. The bond angles wind up getting so large that you a lot of times they'll wind up rearranging themselves to make like a hexagon and then a couple methyl groups instead of being um, a cyclooctane or cyclonoane. Um, they will show up and tend to have small or you know short shelf lives because they tend to rearrange themselves to get back to a hexagon shape. What do you drive it on? What do you mean? Oh, so when we're talking about those, so those are mostly that's a good a good question. Um, remember how we talked about how five, six, seven, eight octane had a different amount of energy, a different enthalpy of combustion compared to the same formula here. Basically, octane, octane rating in gasoline is looking at if you consider burning octane and oxygen as your ideal reaction, everything else is basically just a percentage of this of the energy. So you don't actually have an octane would be 87% of energy. the same energy. Yeah. Expect. So and you so so in most cases you actually will see a difference in mileage even in relatively old cars um, if you put premium gas in versus the eighty seven octane in um, because you'll you have four percent more energy per gallon. What about like ethanol free that doesn't have a percentage of it? That doesn't have a percent. It should still have an octane rating usually. It just says ethanol free. Like down with that, you can get ethanol free gasoline. So that's a different percentage. The, okay. the percentage ethanol we can get up here is usually between 10 and 15 percent ethanol, but it still meets the same um, octane rating. Okay, as 87? As 87. Okay. Um, maybe 85 in some places. Some I think some places still sell 85 gotcha. octane okay. gas. That's the um, point where I can see sigling structures. In but you're, so you, you might see some of them mixed in there. But gasoline is tricky because it's not any one compound. It's a bunch of things. Basically, um, we didn't go over, um, we didn't talk as much about the petroleum distillation as I usually do. But, but basically, anything that condenses around the same temperature winds up getting lumped into the same, the same product. Um, so like any kind of gear oil or lubricating oil is going to be it's going to be higher than gasoline higher diesel yeah uh, melting point pull this one up just for the sake of looking at that figure again so to find that anything in the auto mechanics industry is just hydrocarbons pretty much <laughs> there's a reason why it's been so hard for um for us to um, kick our petroleum dependency is because one stuff out of petroleum um, that we get from refining crude petroleum gets used everywhere. Um, Vaseline, road tar, aircraft fuel, um, motor oil, fuel bearing greases, bearing greases, plastics, plastics, plastics <laughs> um, all of that stuff comes in here. And so this is a really complicated looking 
diagonally with the other one first. This one. So basically, the way these work is it's one giant fractional distillation, where but instead of just having everything come out at the same point, the way we did in our fractional distillation, they have ports all the way up this whole tower, where you, you see each of these little um, walkways is a different height and therefore a different temperature above the part that's being boiled down below. And so they can collect at all these different heights and they're basically just collecting whatever is in the, your crude that happens to condense at a certain at a certain boiling point. So if it's boiling point, um, if it boils below 20 Celsius, then we wind up with, with a lot of things that have between one and four carbons. They wind up get, getting turned into either natural gas or um, precursors for plastics. But then stuff that's, if it's between 20 and 100 Celsius, you're between in that um, five to seven carbons range, a lot of solvents, hexanes, a lot of stuff that the paint thinners, naphtha, stuff like that, winds up being in that range. Um, in the 20 to 200 range, you get stuff that winds up being gasoline. And it's just a mixture of a whole bunch of stuff that is somewhere between those two. And the different octane ratings are basically, okay, this particular bunch hat is mostly this, these five chemicals, and they have this percentage of the energy compared to octane. Um, and they mix some of the higher boiling ones that are higher, that are more dense in energy with the lower energy ones so that they get those really consistent octane ratings. It's not actually this broad of a range. You start with with them, even these will be separated out. And you say, okay, all my C5 stuff doesn't have enough energy. Let me add some more of my C9s into my C5s so that I get up to that 87 octane. And if, you, if you're trying to get to the 91 octane, you add a little bit more of the longer carbons in there. Um, and they're not doing it by specific molecule. They're just saying, okay, anything that's condensing at that higher temperature is going to be higher in energy when it burns. So they're just sort of mixing them together to get these different ratios. So um, by and, that logic, I can technically mix kerosene with my gasoline. Yes. And it should improve your octane rating. Well, 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 <laughs> why why is just, that not being done then? Because for the most part, it's more expensive. Is it? A gallon of... I haven't checked prices recently. It used to be the case. A gallon kerosene of kerosene might be cheaper now. It's like $16 for a gallon of kerosene. But if you increase your gasoline rating with that $16, then you're technically paying less for gas, right? You would have to run the numbers, That's is what I'm saying. Numbers. Because it, at this point, we might be getting close to a crossover point. But there, I had a, a co-worker when I worked this year in Nevada College who would take the OCHEM waste um, and put it in the tank of his Prius. Um, <laughs> And to you know to draw out the uh, length of his gas tank and increase his mileage, and he didn't have any issues with it. And it, so it does work. You can take solvents. You have to be careful with hard, hardware solvents because they might have significantly more water in them than right. others. Um, My truck has the option for GPV fuel, which is jet fuel, but I have to do it electronic like adjustments for that, but it would just be a matter of It'd be a sim similar thing. So, right, kerosene and jet fuel both boil in the same area and have about the same energy content. Right. Um, you add those extra additives that they put in each of them to increase them burning fast versus slow. You don't want kerosene to burn slow um, and evaporate slow compared to the jet fuel. But, yeah, you can take these longer chain hydrocarbons and put them into a, into a fuel tank um, you just have to be make sure it's not so high of a viscosity that you're approaching like diesel. Right. Because it'll just clog. Because then you just wind up clogging your engine up. But $12 yeah. a gallon at Walmart for kerosene. For kerosene? Oh, at 2.5, they, 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 they increased the price of these hardware. <laughs> <laughs> Got some kerosene the other day. It was like 12 bucks. That's what, like three fifty four dollars out there? So yeah, it's, it's probably in that. Yeah, it's really the big addition supplies are going to. Yeah, pretty much. You're you're not we're not quite at that turnover point, and we probably never will get to that point because as the price of gas goes up, the price of kerosene also will go up as we get away from. I've got a significant increase in my fuel mileage 
mm -hmm. just using the ethanol free stuff. But I do have the 95, which doesn't require ethanol for my injectors. So right. there's that. Right. And you wind up, and these are all engineering things, right? These are these are something that chemical engineers work on. Um, my buddy who when I was in grad school at CU, he was getting his undergrad in chemical engineering, got hired by Chevron right out of college, making you know a lot of money. Um, still works for Chevron, um, making so much money. It's good by his first his first couple of years working for Chevron, one of the things he was doing is he was working in the lab that develops the, the additives that they put in it, the what's it, Tecron, the stuff that they add to their gas to make it burn cleaner. He was working in the lab that develops that to sort of optimize performance and then look at, um, you know, how what the long term effects are in terms of corrosion and stuff like that on an engine or engine buildup. Right. Um, so that's all in the engineering side of it. It's like, okay, we know how this stuff kind of works. How can we optimize it? How can we make it last longer? How can we get more mileage out of things? Different materials. Different materials, exactly. Um, so that's definitely something. It, you know, would be a good a good uh, career path to think about in terms of like that the optimizing part of it is is certainly um, that's all engineering, and you're right at the interface when you're talking about engines between chemical engineering and mechanical engineering. You got to have both of them to really understand what's going on. Yeah, the oil lubrication. I'm looking at a lot lately. Yeah, how it actually works. Interesting note down here. Wax, asphalt, and tar. Stuff that, that is what they call a non-volatile solid is all the stuff that's left over sitting in the bottom. Um, that's actually where road tar comes from. It's the byproduct. When you take crude petroleum and you get all the stuff that's actually useful out of it, what's left is black road tar, basically. Um, so you just take that and they just mix it with gravel, and that's what asphalt is, um, is is just a byproduct there, which is why for a long time asphalt was really, really cheap. Um, so by, when when gasoline was really cheap. By this, you have to make one thing to make another. We're always going to need lubricating oil for cars. So an electric car is always going to need gasoline to be made. Yes, or no. Or are you making synthetic? Most motor oils oh. these days are synthetic. Okay. So you don't actually need it anymore. But where you do see that happening, because you have to make all of these at the same time. I'm thinking um, more of like uh, lubricating greases as opposed to oils. Those can be made synthetically too. Yeah. So they're they're just we just have to change what the feedstocks are. It'll change and they'll get more expensive for a little bit. But we can go totally petroleum free with with pretty much everything. It's just that petroleum for a long time was so cheap and so easy to find that we built our entire infrastructure around it. And so now we have to find new plastic precursors. We have to find new we have, um, greases, heating oil. There's actually we don't have much of that on the west coast, but on the east coast, there's still a lot of houses that don't burn natural gas in their furnaces. They actually burn heating oil. Um, and so that's actually why you know, one of the reasons why in the winter gasoline gets cheaper traditionally is because they would have to ramp up production in these um, refineries to make enough heating oil for all the houses in the in the upper Midwest and in the Northeast. Um, and in doing so, they were producing more gasoline. And you couple that with the fact that they don't want to store gasoline because it's they're not in the storage industry; they're in the Combining yeah, industry really and gas goes bad pretty easily, and so they want. And people also tend to drive less in the winter. Nobody's doing as many road trips in the winter, right. so gas prices go down because they have to make more of it, and there's less demand at the same time. But you can't make the heating oil, and but they also they're responsible. They're, the government holds them responsible to a certain level of you need to produce enough heating oil if you're getting all these subsidies we're giving you. So that people don't freeze to death in their homes, um, which seems like a, a weird thing that we have to require a corporation to do. Um, but that's one of the reasons why it's, it's sort of controlled, not controlled, it's a side byproduct of the government mandating that a certain amount of heating oil is produced means gas gets cheaper in the winter. Why does gas go bad? Like what happens to we get water in it? And there's always some amount of water around. It's not it's non-polar, so it doesn't pick up water real easily. 
But if you ever heard, if you've ever heard, like, don't leave gas sitting in your in your um, boat over the winter, or don't leave gas in your snowblower over the summer. So the longer you let gas sit, the more it's going to pick up moisture, and the more moisture it picks up, the um, the worse it is for the engine. As as I understand, that's the the main. There's some components in it that will also oxidize a little bit, but the main concern, I believe, is usually moisture. I never knew what broke it down, but it just turns to like an oil at a certain point. Yeah, if, it, if you leave it in there a long, long time, then you wind up, it might it might be separating a little bit, but I think it's mostly just, it's um, there's some components in there as well that it's, it's hard to say exactly what the reaction is because we have such a broad mixture of stuff in there. Yeah. And it'll even depend a little bit on what refinery you get it from and where that refinery got their crude when they made it. Because different gas, different petroleum deposits have different levels of sulfur or nitrogen or whatever else in them. And that's all the stuff that leads to stuff like smog or and, and tends to oxidize um, when it's sitting there in the shelf as well. And and the moisture is a big is part of what it's reacting with a lot of time. It's either oxygen and oxygen and moisture together. Um, so the more sealed you can keep it, the less that will be an issue. But over time, it will wind up breaking down. Would higher, higher level hydrocarbons grab moisture better than lower levels, like diesel versus gas? It's not really the hydrocarbons that are actually picking up the moisture. It's really whatever other functional groups happen to be around. And so that's going to be on a case by case basis. Um, but probably not, probably related to where the petroleum came from, more so than the length of the hydrocarbons. Gotcha. All right, a couple more slides before we take a break. Um, if we look at the heat of combustion divided by the number of CH2s as a way to sort of normalize so that we're not, so that the number of carbons isn't affecting this. Um, we can actually look at how much strain energy we're seeing in here, because if we look at burning cyclopropane versus burning cyclobutane, we see a pretty big difference. Remember the difference with those, with those other molecules we're talking about was like 18 kilojoules per mole. And this is not, this is, uh, it's bottom is down here. So it's, it's pretty similar. It's about 18 kilojoules per mole difference per carbon, just so that we can, as a way to look at how much strain there is. Um, but you'll notice that it drops pretty dramatically until we hit six. And then once we get past six, it kind of stabilizes. It's about the same for all of these. Um, and I do wish that, I don't quite like the y-axis on this graph because it's a little misleading. You're not actually getting close to zero kilojoules per mole, but you can look at this decrease here is 100% due to less strain energy, because that's the, really the only thing that's different about these, these cases is how much strain energy is. They are all burning CH2s. They're all entirely CH2s with the same generic formula of CnH2n. Right, it's a ring, so it's not 2n plus 2. And so the, really the only difference here is those sterics, is that, that strain energy. And once you get above 6, the reason it sort of flattens out um, is that most of these, yeah, there's three dimensions, so they can kind of get close to the right angles, but they wind up sort of interfering, getting in each other's way. You know, there's still only three dimensions to work with, so there's only so much we can twist these to try and get to 109.5 degrees. Um, and you wind up with causing other steric interactions by twisting it to do that. You wind up with these CH2s kind of running into each other a little bit once you get above six carbons in the ring. So about 12 there, or is that just a kind of exception to that? So 12. 12, you can start looking at it. It's going to start looking like two hexagons. So, so, so you're back to the same general shape, just two of them fused together. They're not actually fused together because that would change the formula. 
but they can occupy that same space, um, like similar in a similar way. Yeah, exactly. But and then, like I said, though, once you get past um, past about C C eight, you wind up these ones wind up not existing for very long anyway, because they'll tend to rearrange into more stable, um, more more stable polygons. All right. So here's the picture showing that banana bond. Right, if you picture, you can see how if these were able to be straight at this bond angle, they overlap significantly more. But by forcing them to be this close together and adding that strain energy in, you, you wind up with them having less overlap. And that's the root of the strain energy is, is it's, you can think of it like, like Velcro a little bit. You get the best grip between two pieces of Velcro when they're completely overlapped, right? If you stretched it out so that you barely had any overlap, they're still gripping, but it's a lot easier to break them apart. And then the actual strain energy is like springs, trying to put two springs. Or yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, and then you'll also see that if we look at a Newman projection of cyclopropane, so this is cyclopropane, this is kind of an interesting way to look at it because this CH2 is attached to our front carbon and our back carbon. So we're looking at the edge of the of the um, three-sided ring. It's in an eclipsed configuration. By having it in a three-sided ring, all three of our carbons by definition have to be in the same plane because it takes three points to define a plane. But that also means that the, the hydrogens attached to these wind up being in an eclipsed configuration. And so that also is going to cause some strain issues and it's not going to be quite as, as stable as it could be. And so this, this creates, we actually are going to uh, break down strain energy into two categories as well. So angle strain is what we were talking about here. By getting these things to be closer than 109.5, closer than the angle that they want to have, that's called angle strain. The type of strain that we talked about first, the rotational strain, when we spin these things around, is called torsional strain. It comes from the same uh, root as torque. So torque has to do is the force of that's um, as it applies to rotation. Torsional strain is strain related to rotation. So would this have more potential energy because it's in the eclipsed? Not yeah. just because it, they're, they're closer together, but because it's torsion. Right, so you've got torsional strain because you've got these hydrogens locked into an eclipsed configuration. There's nothing you can do about it. Right. And then in addition, you're also forcing the bond angles to be closer. So you have both types of strain present when it's cyclopropane. As we start looking at these other ones, they'll, they'll twist around in three dimensions to limit the torsional strain to keep to allow it to be a little bit to less eclipsed, but they'll still have an angle strain. And really, all of these compounds are going to have some amount of both of them. It's just how much can we rearrange things to minimize both of these types of strain, angle strain as well as torsional strain. Angle strain would apply to any atom, right? Anything that's not at its ideal geometry. So any, any tetrahedral atom that's not 109.5 between its bonds is going to have angle strain. Okay. But it won't necessarily have any torsional strain. Gotcha. So the reference point is 109.5. Reference point is still 109.5. And the torsional strains because this molecule, you can't really move it around. Like you can't move, like hysterically, you can't move it. Well, yeah, so, so it's still all single bonds. Single mm -hmm. bonds we think of as being able to rotate. But if you try to rotate this front carbon, you're basically you're breaking the bond with the CH2 and you can't. Or it would drag this with it. Drag it. With it. Yeah. You're, you're not actually rotating this, you're just rotating the, rotating the molecule. molecule. Yeah. Okay. 
right? Because that matters. So rings are tricky that way because they're still made out of sigma bonds that can, and the sigma bonds in theory can rotate, but the ring itself limits the rotation. All right, we'll talk about cyclobutane when we come back. Um, let's just take a five minute break and we'll end class five minutes early because I have to go get my blood drawn. Um, so let's end, so we'll end at 11.45 instead of 11.50, but let's only take a five minute break so we can still get a whole lecture in. This might not be easy to ask, but mm -hmm. if it went from a cyclobutane broke down to a cyclopentane, would that have more or less tortimal strain than if it was to go from propane straight to cyclopropane? Would it have, thinking about the torsional strain specifically? Well, you still didn't have the position state to get there. Right. Um, in the transition state, it's going to look like cyclopropane. Anytime you try to make cyclopropane, anytime you try to make something high energy, the transition state is going to look physically, the geometry of it is going to look pretty close to the high energy state. Okay. So 
it doesn't matter a whole lot what you start from because you're going to have to go through a transition state that's going to be pretty unstable. It's going to look a lot like cyclopropane. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's kind of hard to ask because I'm thinking about it as the atoms shifting as opposed to like them all being independent atoms and independent, like mm -hmm. electrons are independent from the atom kind of thing. Right, but they follow the atoms around. They follow the atoms around, but it is sort of in its own space. Right. So it's, it's just hard to... I mean, if you think about it in terms of, to go to the spring analogy, if you're trying to... If you're trying to, to bend a stiff spring to get it to fit into a certain spot, the hardest bit to get past is the very last bit, right? That's the same thing here. We could take propane and fold it over to try and make it cyclopropane, the last bit is going to be the transition state because that's where it's already the highest energy. Okay. And we're trying to keep it in that high energy state. Gotcha. And then breaking down from, I mean, it wouldn't break down like that from cyclopropane to cyclopropane. That's just not, Did not, not naturally. That's just not happening. Yeah. Um, because if you look at cyclobutane, it's already not that far from it. So you envision taking this and kind of pinning it to that side and making a methyl group um, and cyclo make methyl cyclopropane from cyclobutane. But you're already at, you know, 80 degrees here. So getting it that last bit is going to be the hard no matter what, whether you start from cyclopentane or cyclobutane, getting it to rearrange that last bit is still going to look a lot very similar regardless of what your starting point is. Gotcha. All right. So let's look at cyclobutane. Um, cyclo you take the skeletal structure, we would expect to just be a straight square, right? But the skeletal structure is a square. Um, but because of the um, torsional string, because if we kept it in this perfect square, we have all of these hydrogens. The worst wedge I've ever drawn. We all know what it is, though. But if, if you picture keeping this totally flat, all of these hydrogens are once again locked into um, an eclipsed conformation, right? So the, the extra torsional strain that that creates actually generates a little bit extra angle strain. It'll actually, they call this a pucker. And instead of being flat, it picture a square where you pick up one corner of the square a couple degrees. All right. So if these three, if this is the flat three, you took one corner from over here, kind of pulled it up a little bit. Yeah. And the re the reason that happens naturally, even though that makes our bond angles a little bit less. Yeah. Exactly. I'm trying to do it. Um. <laughs> even though that makes our bond angle a little bit less than 90. So we actually increase the angle strain a little bit by doing that, but we decrease the torsional strain because doing that allows these hydrogens to be in more of an eclipsed conformation, or sorry, more of a staggered conformation. Because if it was flat, then it would be more or less eclipsed with everything else. Exactly. And so basically, if you think of the flat, the flat version here, all of these hydrogens are eclipsed relative to each other, but by picking one of these up, it also allows this, this side, say we picked up this corner, it allows this hydrogen to stick up above this one, which means that it can be in more of it. It's really, it's still, it's still not a true staggered confirmation, but it's better than completely eclipsed. I'm draw the Newman. So, before I try and <laughs> see if I have that on the next slide. Projections with the bonds between them. So, let's.
So it would be if it if it was totally planar, we would have something where these were perfectly eclipsed. But if we picked up that back corner a little bit, that allows this one to be more like that and like that. See, we're offset not by a full 60, but maybe by by um, I not by, by a full 30 degree. No, it would be 60. By like 40 degrees, 30 degrees, instead of being stuck in that zero degrees perfectly, if it was perfectly planar. So two of the angles are decreased, but the other two are increased, right? No, so actually all of these we're going to have an interior angle of 88. Okay. It is symmetrical, even though it's convenient for us to picture it as being three flat points and one picked up. Mm -hmm. But since it's 3D, it's going to have... You can pick any three of these to make your flat spot. So, and then the other one we picked... Okay. If we picked even the um the front three, if we picked these to be our flat plane, then our flat plane is like this, and the one that's sticking up is what the actually be sticking down in that case, but sticking out of the plane would be the one in the back. Right? So no matter which three you pick, you're gonna wind up with one of them. The, uh, the fourth point out of the plane and all of them having the same symmetrical 88 degrees on their interior angle. So this is one of the reasons why, um, to not one of the reasons, this is one application of what's called non-Euclidean geometry. This is still technically Euclidean geometry, but when you involve three spaces, Euclidean geometry typically deals with things that are in a true plane. So a square has to have 90 degrees on all of its interior angles in order to be a square, right? However, if you put a square on the surface of a sphere, you actually get different bonding or different angles on the interior of it, right? Because that's not Euclidean geometry assumes everything's flat. Right? Exactly. And so we wind up with, well, that's that's exactly what it is. A curved surface is no longer a flat surface, which makes it non-Euclidean. Which means rules like this. This we can consider this a square for the sake of organic chemistry, where all of your interior angles are 88 degrees. So it doesn't add up to the same amount that it normally should. Right, so just one one case of um, three dimensions makes the geometry trickier. It's still you can still visualize it, but it's different than the way we think about geometry in two dimensions. Even if we frequently have to draw it in two dimensions. Would this be more stable if you thought of it as like um, flipped the carbons on either end like opposite from I guess it's kind of trying to cherry pick that, <laughs> but it's just hard to do. So <laughs> basically, if you try to flip this the other way, you get the same shape pointed the other direction. Just ninety degrees. Yeah. Um, and we see the same, we're not going to deal a whole lot with cyclo, cyclo, um, propane or cyclobutane because they're so unstable. We want to understand why these have, have that so much higher strain energy. Um, but for the most part, we want to, we're going to spend more time in thinking about cyclohexane because that's actually, with that being the most stable, um, understanding why and how that behaves winds up being really critical. Um, cyclopentane, you'll see, actually behaves very, very similar to cyclobutane, where you've got three of your, in this case, four of your points. You think of these four as being flat and sticking straight into the board, out of the board. If my thumb is the, uh, I'm not double jointed, so that's not going to work very well. Um, there. there you go. If my thumb is the, the front most carbon here, it's basically just popped out of the plane just a little bit. So just, like lift it up. just lift it up a little bit, just like the cyclobutane, except 
with the cyclopentane, it's even easier to visualize, if anything. You know? um, the tricky part about it is that it's really two of these that are actually popped up. One pops slightly above the plane, one pops and one pops slightly down. If you think of these three as being symmetrical, as being as defining the plane here, if that's the plane coming straight into the board and out of the board, one of this one's cocked slightly above the plane, this one's cocked slightly below the plane, which allows for, for us to get closer to minimize this torsional strain and get closer to the 190 as we can to the 109 degrees. Um, and if you and so it does wind up sort of rotating and depending on how you visualize things. Um, this typically is the easiest way to represent it. You could draw it totally flat with where we had one carbon, four of them in the same plane, one sticking up. It's not quite True, because like I said, one sticks up, one sticks a little bit down, but it still does have that puckered shape. You just can't really get it. It's just really hard to to show it in three dimensions accurately. If you dash and wedge at the same time, it's just the black. <laughs> it does. You you can try. <laughs> um, and so here's. I knew I had a Newman projection for one of these more complicated ones. Um, so here's what your Newman projection looks like for cyclopentane, so if we're looking along this line right here, by having that puckered shape, we get something almost to our 60 degrees. So almost a true staggered confirmation. And because of the nature of this, all of these angles, we could have picked any of them. This is the one that's easiest to visualize, but if we visualized it, Looking at that angle from this angle, this direction, it's going to be very similar. It's going to look really, really similar, um, just with the front and the back flipped here. Basically, this one is going to be above, okay, beside that one. Um, the point is, is that having this three-dimensional shape allows us to get that staggered confirmation, and which minimizes a little bit of that torsional strength. We don't get rid of it entirely. And we don't get rid of the angle strain entirely either. I don't have the, the number up here, but this bond angle is now a little bit less than 108 as well. So we're still not perfect. It's probably something more like 105 degrees. But 105 degrees, we know from water, 105 degrees is your bond angle. It's not that unstable when it comes to these, these geometries. So cyclohexane is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time because cyclohexane is just complicated enough that it gets, has just enough atoms that it gets pretty complicated. And it's also the most stable. So we need to spend the most time understanding why it's so stable because it shows up everywhere. And the, the trick with this is that it actually has two different shapes to get it relatively close to being stable. Um, You've got the chair conformer. They call this the, if you visualize this is where you would put your head. This is as a, um, where you put your feet on a recliner or a, uh, a lawn chair. Um, and then these four would be the seat of the chair. This one's easier to see because it looks, it looks kind of like a boat, like specifically like a canoe, basically, right? You've got the points up at the end. You got the low bit in the middle. Which of these would we expect to be more stable, would you think? Why? I just like the way it looks, honestly. <laughs> it is a lot easier to draw in a lot of ways. Um, it seems like the chair. The chair? And why, um, Jerry? It doesn't look like everything's like clumped together compared to the boat roll of hydrogens. Exactly. Like top, hold, 
they're kind of more, they're kind of pointed in the same general direction. Pointed in the same general direction. So sterics would point, would uh, indicate that this is slightly more stable just because we get our big groups attached. If we think of those four middle ones as being the same in energy, either way, this one puts the head and the, and the feet of the chair are pointed in opposite directions. So there's a little bit less steric interaction that way. It's not see the numbers on the next, um, not on the next one yet, but we'll look at it in a second. If we look at the chair, it also makes it so that we're we're locked into a stagnant conformation because we wind up with um, if we're looking at at this end on the way the hydrogens attached here wind up being shaped so that they're about sixty degrees from each other. If we took the the end here, if we flipped this up. That would be like rotating it about 60 degrees, right? We do the same thing for the chair. We wind up with it being just a nightmare. <laughs> No, but you wind up with them being in these eclipsed conformations yeah. where your hydrogens are right on top of your hydrogens and your CH2 is right on top of your CH2s. This is the boat? This would be the boat. So just take, you can picture grabbing this and rotate, flipping it up. So that, but when you do that, you are rotating the whole thing like 60 degrees, kind of, or like not quite. This this one does have enough freedom of motion that you can do that without rotating the whole molecule. Oh, okay. And we'll we'll actually build these um, probably on on um, Tuesday. We'll bring some of the models in. You can actually build this and without breaking any of the pieces off, you can actually get it to flip from chair to to boat without twisting the whole molecule. Um, and it's kind of like, uh, I don't want to use that analogy yet because that works better later. Um, well, the recliner is a decent analogy for it, right? Your recliner is stable with the, with the footrest down and it's stable with the footrest up, but there's a point in the middle where you have to get past the transition state. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. And so there you go, better than I can draw it. Boat conformation looks really similar, except by flipping that end up, we get that, um, those torsional interactions. And then we also wind up with, I didn't draw out the hydrogens on the end of the boat here, on the, 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 the bow and stern of the boat. Um, but if you did and looked at those tetrahedral carbons, you actually end up with those two hydrogens pointed like right at each other. So that's that's that steric strain or that steric interactions we were talking about. They're kind of vaguely, the carbons are just kind of vaguely pointed in the same direction, but the hydrogens attached to the carbons are pointed at each other then. Um, and they call that a flagpole interaction. I don't know if that's because they've already named it the boat inner and you know put a flag on the front and the back of a boat. And it, but I don't, I don't know where that comes from, but you can kind of visualize it as putting a flag on the front of the boat and the back of the boat, um, and them both being pointed the same direction then. Two mass, what's it called? <laughs> Ten mass. The angles start falling apart because our brains, especially with boats, our brains like 90 degree angles. We don't like 109.5 degree angles. They're harder for us to think about. But you can see how if I took this, and I put the and I put the footrest down, so to speak. Then all of a sudden that disappears. So for two reasons, both the torsional strain that we get and the steric interactions, those flagpole interactions, both point towards the chair being more stable. So numerically, you can see this. We can actually see some pretty large numbers compared to the kilojoules per mole we were seeing for for staggered versus eclipsed. 
going for from the chair conformer to the boat conformer. Turns out the boat is because of those flag pole interactions and the eclipse um, the eclipse confirmation. The boat actually is is actually a potential energy maximum, a local maximum. It's a transition state because you can if you picture these flagpole interactions and these these hydrogens being pointed right towards each other. If we just tweak the boat a little bit, we can get them to point past each other. And so they call that a twist boat. It's in the it's the boat conformer because you've got both ends pointed up, but they're tweaked a little bit so that those so flagpoles exactly. And so and we see that that even the twist boat is still 20 kilojoules, 23 kilojoules per mole less stable than the chair conformer. So the chair is our absolute minimum for this for this uh, molecule. We can get if we go past. So this is our transition state. This is that point where you're halfway through putting your chair, your footrest up on a recliner, where it's flat. The other the other analogy here is that I use here is it's kind of like an umbrella turning inside out. If you've ever had an umbrella catch the wind and turn inside out, and then when you try to put it back. There's a point when you're doing that where it's like perfectly flat. It's not inside out or the regular way for an umbrella, right? That's the transition state. Because you're doing that to half of the umbrella and you get the half chair. So you're in the process of going from chair to twist bow. And there's that half chair point in the middle that's really fairly unstable. Although if you think about the numbers that I threw for for, con for context, 100 kilojoules per mole means it happens pretty rapidly at room temperature. So we're still talking about something that's constantly happening uh, at room temperature. This is a big barrier, but it's not so big that it's to say like it won't happen at room temperature. If we cooled it way down, if we, did, if we put cyclohexane at liquid nitrogen temperatures, we could get it to lock into chair pump. And then it wouldn't have enough in, uh, energy to make it over this barrier to get to the twist boat. Um, which is why one of the reasons why um, a lot of times um, certain medical devices need to be at liquid nitrogen temperatures. Um, MRI machines in particular, you need to keep them super cool because you're trying to limit how much molecular motion there is. Because that generates noise and that causes it to be harder for you to actually measure. Obviously, we can't cool down a human's body to liquid nitrogen temperature. That we would get really, really detailed MRIs if we could do that. <laughs> but we, just, that, you know, no <laughs> we also wouldn't be worried about treating that patient anymore at that point. <laughs> be rude, yeah. So there's no flat hex. So <laughs> exactly. So if you if you could do a complete flat Planer, that would be the peak of both. That would be like double this. Yeah. So it would, probably, it would probably be about 90 kilojoules per mole. So in theory, you could see that happening to some extent, but it's so so much less likely. Because remember that with these with these rate equations, there's that exponential relationship. Mm -hmm. So remember, our yeah. equilibrium constant has the same general form as our, uh, sorry, our kinetic constant, our rate constant has the same general form as our equilibrium constant, except it's activation energy over RT. So there is an exponential relationship. If you double your activation energy, you can way, um, you can really, really slow it down. I'm trying to think it was about every five kilojoules difference in the activation energy. That's about a factor of 10 difference in the rate constant. So going from 45 kilojoules per mole to 90 kilojoules per mole, 10 to the nine times slower in terms of rate constants. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's at room temperature. That's assuming that we're at 298 Kelvin. So it's not like it's happening a trillion times, or is it, or a billion, a billion times slower. So it's a billion times less likely to see that. Not to say that it never happens, or because nothing ever never happens. Statistically, statistically insignificant, exactly. Um, 
you think of like origami. <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah, being able to visualize it like that is really helpful too. Um, and I bet one of the trickiest things with with these um, cyclohexanes is drawing them and showing the shape in a way that's helpful. So drawing the chair conformer um, is actually a skill in and of itself to be able to draw that by hand. Uh, And the way that I usually do it is you draw two parallel lines slightly offset from each other. And then you draw a B connecting two of them and a B connecting an upside down B connecting the other two. I don't like that, so I'm gonna redraw it. <laughs> I think that's the, gets the general gist, but it still does take a little bit of practice. Um, there are some textbooks have different ways to do it. They say some of them will say start with a wide inverted V and then do a second wide inverted V and then connect them. And it looks a little bit more like it's relaxing. You can tell I don't use that one as often um, because I'm, I'm noticeably worse at doing it that way. Um, the other one that's really interesting is the old Budweiser logo <laughs> is a cyclohexane. It's supposed to look like a bow tie, but it's basically this rotated a little bit. Um, and now you'll never, once I, once you look at it again, never unsee it. And this is enough of a meme. I'm, yeah, look at that. It shows up in the chemistry Our subreddit. Slash chemistry. Oh, oh, you're okay. Well, yeah. That's a chair conformer of cyclohexane. You can see how they're they're aiming for it to look like a bow tie, mm -hmm. but but they stylized it just enough that it actually looks to an organic chemist like a cyclohexane in the chair conformer. All right, so this is this is from one of the textbooks that says draw a wide V, then draw the line going down to 60 degrees, ending just before the center of the V. Like this seems to be more complicated than my you know, draw two parallel lines and then draw <laughs> draw two to connect them. Um, but obviously they're depending on your own personal preference and drawing abilities, you might you know find what works for you because we're going to continue to do this. When we're going to talk about the sterics involved here, um, because it turns out when we look at my figure got shifted. Um, when you, when you have these cyclohexanes in the chair conformation, every, the hydrogens that are attached to each of them are gonna be pointed away from everything else, right? And so that kind of creates two positions that are actually different from each other. Normally we would think of the two, those two hydrogens as being identical in terms of their energy. Um, but for each of these, are hydrogens attached to a cyclohexane carbon, you wind up with one of those substituents being what we call the axial position and one in the equatorial position. So equatorial, just like equator, means it's pointed out right around the circumference of the molecule, pointed away from everything else. And axial means pointed up and down relative to the rest of the molecule. All right, so if I... It can be helpful also to, to draw this with the wedges and dashes a little bit to, so that you can look at it. So this part of the molecule is sticking out towards us. So for this carbon right here at the top, 
we have a line going into the board that's connecting to this carbon here. And then we have a line coming out of the board that's connecting to the blue carbon here. Where are the other two height, the other two bonds here then? And then one in the plane pointed sort of in that direction, right? The one that's straight up and down is axial. And the one that's pointed away from everything else, but still in the plane of the board, that's our equatorial. <laughs> Almost got to the Almost got to the <laughs> and, but the thing is, each of these carbons has an axial position and an equatorial position. They're not always as easy to see as the ones at the top and the bottom. So for the for the bottom, what would those look like? Mirror image. In mirror image, right? We have one kind of pointed that direction and one pointed straight down, basically. There's our axial. There's our equatorial. Because your bond, remember that every tetrahedral carbon is the way we usually draw them is two bonds that are flat, one into the board, one out of the board. So for this, our one into the board is going in the back carbon there, our one out of the board is going to going to the front part of the seat. And then our other two have to be in the plane of the board, but pointed away from the uh, out of the board into the board pair. So how about this blue carbon? What would that look like? One hydrogen has to be right and one straight down. Yeah, so here's this big thick bond is the one that's in the plane of the board. So then we have another one in the plane of the board. Here's our bond that's going back. So our other one would be coming out from there. Which one's axial? Yeah. The axial ones are usually the easier to, to, uh, to recognize. If you know that every carbon has one axial and one equatorial, axial is usually the easiest to find because it's going to be pretty close to a vertical line. Regardless of if it's pointed up or down, there's an axial, there's an axial, there's an axial, there's an axial. And our equatorial would be pointed out towards us, the same general direction as that bond going away from us. It seems like the equatorial ones are like on a, on a plane, whereas the axial ones are just on a round. Axial, yeah, exactly. And that's why they have that name. Equatorial, if you think about the cyclohexane itself as being the equator, the belt around them with the molecule, then the equatorial are in that same general plane as the rest of the molecule and the axial are pointing roughly 90 degrees from the rest of that plane. And the other way to do this, basically every single carbon is gonna have an axial and equatorial and the axials alternate. If you drew this axial up, this axial is gonna go down. This axial is going to go up. This axial is down. This axial is up. This axial is down. And then once you can find the axial ones, the equatorial are always going to be sticking away from everything else. And so it takes practice. If, especially this, this is a mess of lines now, right? It's hard to be able to take this mess of lines that I just drew and see a three-dimensional object. It'll take a little bit of practice visualizing it.
Um, and this is also where mold view can wind up being really helpful. Yeah, I was I'm just on mold view right now <laughs> looking at it. Are you on the app? No. I think the app allows the app. you to share the link so you can see. Really? Yeah, the axle. There actually, so we'll look at that in just a second. I don't mean to step on your saying, Sean, but. <laughs> no, no. Um, we're getting, we haven't talked about about why axial versus secretorial is important yet. That'll make more sense in a second. So you've used the app though, is the app pretty pretty good? I mean, like I said, there's benefits in you know, six to both of them to have in the action. If you just have both of them open, then you can play with both and you have all of the options. So there's our chair confirmer, right? Flip it one more time. I was saying, if I flip it one more time, it's going to look better than it never does. Um, it can, it's still kind of hard to see, but if this is our headrest, here's our axial position, equatorial position. Here's our axial position, equatorial is pointing straight, straight out towards us. Axial is up and down, equatorial is pointed away from everything else. In general, axial is going to be pointed towards other part of the molecule, and equatorial is pointed away from everything else. So when that that is winds up being important, because that means that if we have something where one of our substituents is not uh, a hydrogen, that winds up being significant because, like we pointed out earlier, those flagpole interactions and those other um, steric interactions wind up being important. So if we start by drawing um, rope, or just start by drawing we did this plan, that will still work. Our cyclohexane here. If we draw bromos, this bromocyclohexane, let's just pick one spot. Usually, when we're drawing drawing these confirmations, whatever substituent you have that's not hydrogen, it's easiest to put it on either the, the headrest or the footrest of our chair, um, just because those are the bonds that are going to be in the plane of the board, right? The substituents are in the plane of the board then. If we take this and do what's the other way we could draw this, would be putting the bromine not in an axial position the way it's drawn here, but putting it in the equatorial position. Those aren't quite the same. Those are different conformers, even though they're both chair configuration, they're both bromocyclohexane, but putting the bromine in an axial position versus the equatorial position means different sterics, different torsional strain, different angle strain. Because if we look at what's, a, what's nearby, we look at the other axial positions, in this case, the bromine and these two hydrogens wind up being pointed in the same general direction, right? And bromine's this big object that takes up lots of space. Whereas if, if we put bromine in the equatorial position, it's pointed away from everything else. So in general, putting the larger substituent in the equatorial position is more stable. But this is an ongoing process because like we saw before with that potential energy surface, this can flip around. If we put this into the boat confirmation, if we flip this end down, yeah. we would have something that looks like Like this, when you flip one end of the molecule 
into the opposite configuration, you flip axial versus equatorial. If you can picture taking this headrest and flipping it down this way, the bromine is up here, right? So the bromine is going to flip down with it and now be pointed in equatorial. Yeah, so it being axial just means. Exactly. So we can convert each of the, any substituent can be either axial or equatorial and still have it be the same molecule. But which conformer is favored is always going to be the one that puts the largest substituent in an equatorial position. And then finishing what we call a chair flip, which I still, I always will think of that as being like a, a WWE move it sounds like a WWE move, a chair flip. You finish the chair flip, we're back into being a chair conformer. But on this one, all we had was hydrogens, right? So the hydrogen is being in the axial or sectorial, it's identical both ways. Or if we had two bromines, those are the same in terms of energy because one's axial and one's equatorial. But if you only have the one bromine, you're going to favor the conformer that allows you to put the largest substituent in the equatorial position. All right, so the, the these slides basically are some more, we'll go through these in more detail. Um, the quiz this weekend is going to be on some Newman projection stuff, drawing some Newman projections, and then I'm going to have you draw some chair conformers, and I'm, I might have you predict which one's more stable for these for molecules. I'm going to be like this, draw both chair conformers of this molecule and predict which one's more stable. And we'll spend more time on the why and what to do when there's more than one thing attached um, on Tuesday of next week. So you said equatorial is more favorable. Equatorial, the largest substituent in the equatorial position. And even when it's something as small as a methyl and at equilibrium, said, it's 95 to 5. Yeah, I know you said it four times, but I was no. sure. <laughs> I frequently misspeak, but just to reiterate, the larger you make that group, the bigger the difference. When it was a methyl group, it was 95 to 5. When it's a T-butyl group, 99.99 to 0.01 percent right so and bromine is about the size of a tbo group so the larger the substituent the more we see this effect all right i gotta get my blood drawn so i will upload this and uh get the, the quiz ready for you opening this afternoon as usual Hey, did you ever send us the um I did not? That's on my to-do list for today as well. Okay. I'll be stretching what I have to do today or Tuesday. Did everybody have time to get their melting points? I mean, yeah, I didn't it didn't melt, I, but it yeah. didn't melt. The, the two that did melt. Yeah, the one the one that didn't melt. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs>